for the News and Observer. I'm Dawn Vaughn, your host of Under the Dome for this week of Monday, July 17th, 2023. I'm here today with Representative Marsha Morey, a term Democrat. Morey is the House Democratic Whip, a former judge and former Olympic swimmer. Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Good to be here. Um, if you're watching the video version of this, we're sitting in her office in the legislative building. And if you notice these uh, that we record, Democrats and Republicans have different offices depending <laughs> on uh, who's in power at the yeah, time, right? Notice cell block. <laughs> a lot of the building is kind of a cell block. <laughs> so um, insert uh, whatever joke there about that. Um, so I mentioned at the start, of course, some people are probably already familiar with you as being, um, being a Democrat, being from Durham. Maybe not the Olympics, that comes up sometimes. So um, for anyone that didn't know that you um, competed in the Olympics, tell us about that. Uh, ancient history, uh, it was 1976 in Montreal. Uh, and you can see I have no medals, so I am working the rest of my life to make a living. <laughs> well, you're the only one in the, maybe ever in the legislature that's competing in the Olympics. I have I no know, idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's segue immediately to legislation <laughs> then. Um, what did you think about the women in sports bill? You know, Don, that, that's a tough one because when I did compete in 1976, the East German women had all been given male hormones, testosterone, to improve their performance. And it was shown they had an unfair advantage because they had years of this steroid treatment and injections. So the women's sports bill kind of hit home to me because we were defeated by East Germans in every event except one uh, by substantial margins because of performance enhancing drugs. I felt that the, the nature of the combination of these bills were all anti-LGBTQ. Uh, I think they were mean-spirited. I think the high school association had a good way to monitor, to oversee uh, applications for athletes to participate in sports. I think the key is participation in sports does so much for someone's development, and especially the middle school and the high school. And so I, I was opposed to that bill. I still am. The governor has vetoed it, and we'll see if there's an override. But uh, I think participation in middle and high school is not the world-class level. It's not the Olympic level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's taking part and being on a team that matters. What do you think about the college athlete aspect of it? Well, and once again, I think the NCAA is the governing body for sports. Let them decide. When government intrudes on these decisions, it, the government action of it, I think, uh, is the bad thing. Let, let the governing sports bodies make the decisions. What did you think about the Republican arguments in favor, that saying that they, you know, that this is something that people should support, you know, more broadly? Um, but the, maybe the more broad aspect is that this has been in um, similar bills and other um, Republican-controlled legislatures across the country. So I think there are multiple factors at play of, of them running it. Oh, it is. And it's a combination. Over 500 bills across the country have been targeting uh, the LGBTQ community. I, and once again, in sports, I mean, there was a swimmer, Leah Thomas, who swam, uh, who swam as a man her first two years and then transitioned to a woman and was wiping out the competition. That case needs to be looked at because I don't think that was a fair playing field. So let the governing bodies do it. Get the politics at it and the legislature out of it. Do you think that, um, you know, being in the super minority is there, <laughs> obviously you disagree with a lot of the bills that have passed. Is there a bill you would describe as the worst bill this session? Um, or a, or is, is there a best bill, a best bill not having? I mean, you know, there's a lot of smaller bills that everyone agrees on, you know, to, or for the most part. But what do you see as the... Is it some of these um, LGBTQ bills? Is it the abortion bill? Is it something something else? Are any of the gun or gun bills not moving? Right. Um, I think when we are trying to legislate what happens in a decision between a medical doctor and a family member and a parent, we're going too far. You know, I totally agreed with the Roe versus Wade when it was overturned. We have 50 states in chaos now. Uh, I don't think the legislature should be stepping in and deciding the health of a woman 
that is at odds with her doctor's advice or her, her own life. So, mm -hmm. you know, and for the transgender kids to now be prohibited from having any type of treatment, puberty blockers before they're 18, that's government intrusion into private medical decisions. Um, yeah, I am a big gun safety proponent, and I've been here since 2017. I've introduced nine or ten bills for gun safety, mm -hmm. even safe storage of guns. You know, it's common sense. If you have a gun in a vehicle, store it. Put it in a locked container. It never got a committee hearing. Um, you know, and that's playing politics. I mean, I think we had good ideas. Even Senator Tom Tillis supported the red flag law that a judge can order a gun removed from someone who's dangerous to themselves or others. And we can't even get a hearing on that. And it's passed many uh, Republican states. What do you think the reason is for that, with with Tillis being obviously a more well-known nationally Republican than, you know, the, the Speaker or the Senate leader here? Um, and they just haven't, is it the two of, you know, Berger and Moore haven't had the interest? Do you think there's other other Republicans in the House or Senate that have their ear more as far as not wanting to do anything with the extreme risk protection orders because that's something that has seen bipartisan support where, you know, some people are going to say we're never going to, you know, do this sort of right. um, regulation bill that Democrats want, but there is more room than just um, safe storage awareness, which, you know, Dahl and Hannig both like. So why do you, what do you think that is about the protection orders? I don't know. I, I, the more I talk one on one, and especially to Republicans, I think they they see the the benefit of it. But I think we have a Freedom Caucus, especially in the House, that's grown. Representative Kidwell's the leader of it, and he is totally don't touch my gun rights. Um, so I hope in the future there will be dialogue and common sense. Do you think it's things shifting with more of public um, shifts? I mean, a lot of. It already shows like a lot of polling that, you know, most yeah. Americans, most North Carolinians do support um, stricter gun laws than there are right now. Right. But do you think it just needs to be a, a bigger shift or it becomes more or less a campaign issue, something like that? Or I, more homicides, I guess? Right. Or? Well, and it, it ebbs and flows. We haven't had a mass shooting, thank goodness, here, uh, mass murder in North Carolina. We had a horrible one in Raleigh last year. We're going to have another one. And then the debate will rise back up again. And I think there will be more public outcry and demand. It's going to come back eventually. Okay. Um, what, what shifted this session when the power shifted after Representative Cotham left the Democrats to become Republican? It's still just one vote. And, of course, there are some moderate Democrats that were going to vote with Republicans anyway on bills, including her, as far as what we, what we watch. Has there been... Was, did one person make that much of a shift in what you've seen in maybe the, 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 the temperature on the floor and the type of things in legislation that you're seeing? Or was that just kind of an all-session sort of vibe? No, I, that one shift uh, made a tr dramatic difference. And that's because the Republicans have held strong together in almost every vote. They do not deviate. They do not break ranks. They follow what leadership says. They follow, you know, where they're going to stand. All of our debates, all of our pleadings with amendments to point out unconstitutional issues and bills, we don't usually get one or two Republicans to listen to reasoning. As a judge, I point out legal problems with some of these bills. They stick together as a unit. And once they stick together as a unit, they have a supermajority and they can uh, have anything pass. What do you think about uh, some of the court provisions and the budget proposals? You know, the budget uh, passed the House, went to the Senate. The Senate made dramatic changes. It came back to the House, but we have never had a debate on it. It was up for non-concurrence. So that means it's in conference. Um, within the Senate budget is a lot of policy that has nothing to do about money. Being a former judge, I'm really concerned about the judicial issues contained in that budget. Mm -hmm. It gives the legislature the ability to make judicial appointments for special superior court judges. They appoint 10 judges, mm -hmm. taking it away from the governor. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, no, that's fine. Um, the right to have an appeal to the Supreme Court if there's a split decision on the Court of Appeals 
is a big change. Judicial standards, I think most people won't understand the change of that. They're removing all the lawyers from hearing judicial standards complaints and giving more appointments to the Chief Justice who would control uh, 12 of the 14 appointments. Lawyers know judges' demeanor, ethics, when a judge is over the bounds of propriety. Why are we taking lawyers off of judicial standards? It's becoming just too political. Um, and then any constitutional issue, they've removed the senior resident judge in Wake County and two judges from being on those panels, giving the chief justice total ability to appoint any three judges he's, he so chooses. I think those are serious mistakes for the independence of our judiciary. All right, well, let's talk more about the budget and justice um, after a quick break. And we'll also, um, when we come back, we'll talk about headliner of the week as well. You're listening to Under the Dome. I'm Capitol Bureau Chief Don Bond here with Representative Marsha Mori. Before the break, we were talking about changes in the courts and something else that has to do with courts and the budget is a change that was in the House budget, which didn't end up staying in there, um, but is an example of a lot of changes to give more power to the conference of district attorneys. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that, about different ways that's been showing up. They were this bill that I believe actually went through um, gave them the ability to have instead of one lobbyist, four lobbyists, and the conference pushed back and it just said, well, it's we're more like other groups now where we can have that many. It's not that we are going to have that many, but the one provision that wasn't, uh, we'll find out if it's in the final budget, um, was in the House budget, would have given the executive director the pension for judges. Um, right. So what do you think about those those changes? I am a former prosecutor, so I was an assistant DA for years in Durham, and, you know, so I really think a lot of good prosecutors seeking justice. I have seen over the five years I've been here that the DA's conference is gaining more and more influence over lobbying here at the General Assembly. And we have a lot of criminal justice bills come up. We had a bill that said if you wear a hoodie in the commission of a crime by wearing a hoodie or a mask or any device, you can be charged with a crime higher than the crime you're actually doing. To me, which makes no sense. Because of what you're wearing, you get a higher charge than the crime. And the Conference of DAs comes in and said, yes, we're totally supportive of this bill. It should pass. And for them to take that harsh stance and position as they do on increasing criminal penalties on many of our uh, laws this year, mm -hmm. on rioting on that, the Republicans do listen to what they're advocating for, and for the most part, go along with it every time. So I wish there was more of a balance. Um, the executive director, I don't see, would have the same authority and responsibilities uh, for judicial retirement as judges do, doing a full-time job as the head of IDS does, overseeing hundreds of public defenders. The conference, the DAs, is comprised of 40 people and they have two conferences a year, and now also a full-time lobbyist here. So I think they're doing quite well, but let's keep it in perspective. How much do you think the different lobbying groups, and then, I mean, a lot of the um, bills in judiciary, the sheriff's you know group is weighed in. Right. How much do you think the um, that's things driven by policy and lobbyists and, and having the air of lawmakers versus the, the rank and file, um, I mean, rank and file attorneys, rank and file law enforcement, or anything um, where it's, you know, you're representing all these people and then it's a lot different situation in the building, when I mean the building, the legislative building, um, with things that end up affecting daily lives for a lot of people. You know, Don, I think it, it's kind of like the way we have gone when we're electing judges on a partisan basis. Um, I think more of judges who label themselves as independent or Democrat say we want fair and impartial judiciary. We want fair and impartial laws that hold people accountable, but also if someone's mentally ill, you take that into account. If someone's six years old, you take that into account when you prosecute. 
compared to, I think, the conference of DAs and many Republican judges, they run on law and order, mm -hmm. that people re resonate to that. I follow the Constitution, and if someone's charged, you're innocent until you're proven guilty, and that if you have a substance abuse mental health issue, that should be taken into account to help some not become a repeat offender. So I think it's two philosophies um, that we can have a much better understanding coming together. Um, but once the conference of DA lobbies, I mean, it's pretty much most Republicans will jump in. Sheriff's Association, too. Um, I mean, they are law enforcement, so they will take a harder stance on a lot of issues. Uh, well, speaking of partisanship and judges, uh, what do you see with the shift? We were talking about the shift with the supermajority and the, and the General Assembly. The um, Democrats had... Um, the majority on the state Supreme Court until the last election. Now, majorities, uh, the Republicans had the majority on the Supreme Court. How do you see that playing out with things like the um, board's appointment, uh, appointments bills, and whatever else ends up coming to them from the building? Well, we're, we're seeing a lot of legislation coming out. I, I think it's interesting uh, the Republicans are the party of less government. But we're seeing many bills come in. We want more power. We want the legislature to appoint judges. We want the legislature to take away government, the governor's appointees on the Board of Elections, Board of Education, mm -hmm. give it more to the, the legislature. I think our separation of powers is important. The governor is elected by all people throughout the state. All of us, at least in the House of Representatives, have a small district. We're elected by 25 to 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. Um, so we should keep that in mind. And I think the appointment power needs to be where it is for a good check and balance. The, the Supreme Court stepping in and overturning decisions that were just made last year by a different majority on the court, and there's no new case in front of them, I think that's a dangerous precedent. What do you think about the, uh, I mean, historically, North Carolina's governor doesn't have a lot of power. Um, and it looks like it's going to be even less power. <laughs> what do you, what do you think about uh, about that shift? As far as I mean, your view as being part of the legislature yeah. and that balance of power. Well, w once again, I think power begets power, and we're taking on too much, and uh, a supermajority that keeps wanting more and more power, not allowing localities to decide how they're going to elect their school boards, or if it's partisan or nonpartisan. Uh, I think we're getting out of whack, and we need to get back to a more stable balance. Would you say the same if, if Democrats yes. have a supermajority? Yes, majority? yes. Yeah. I've been here since 2017. I've been in the minority ever since I came. And many times people say, well, the Democrats did that when they were in power. It doesn't make it right. And maybe it's my Olympic background or, you know, being a judge. I want fair. I want a fair playing field. And, you know, even what I see now on the floor, we're coming up to vetoes, we're coming up to important bills, and we're not allowed to speak. Mm -hmm. The Republicans are calling the question. And once they call the question, we're cut off from speaking or debating. Mm -hmm. It goes right to a vote. And that's happened four or five times in the last few weeks. All we have is our voice. They have the votes. Mm -hmm. At least give us the opportunity to express our concerns about certain bills. You know, we have committee meetings. We're evenly split, and floaters come in from the majority party to make sure the vote goes the way they want it to vote. We have to get back to fairness. Um, you talked about you being a judge, and, and um, I mean, people listening to this know that I used to cover Durham, and you were, you know, Judge Maury before I knew you were Representative Maury. So um, <laughs> one of your fellow lawmakers, your Democratic lawmakers, or Durham, well, same thing, Durham Democrat generally, um, is uh, going to run for Durham mayor, uh, Senator Mike Woodard, who I assume you've known for a while. What do you think about how the uh, Durham mayoral race and council races are going to shape up? And there are two, it's the perennial candidates are one of them that is also running, and we'll find out who else uh, declares to run for mayor, or there's already some people running for, for council re-election. Yeah. So what, what's your take on, on local Durham politics? It is always exciting. It will remain always exciting. And, and we'll just see my former colleague on the bench, uh, Elaine O'Neill, went from being a judge to being mayor. And now she's not running. And now Mike's going from the Senate running for mayor. So Durham is an interesting place. We have lively debates and discussions. So, you know, uh, I wish all the candidates well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so I'm going to segue to the lighter part of our um, 
uh, conversations whenever I have a lawmaker is ask what they get in the legislative cafeteria or the snack bar or the legislative office building cafeteria slash snack bar. So what's your what's your go to item? What do you eat? I'm not the banana pudding kind of eater that uh, John Bell is. Um, I don't go to the cafeteria much. At best, I go to the snack bar, get a good old cheeseburger, bring it up here and eat it in my cell block. All right, I think that's the first um, first cheeseburger vote we've had there, here. There um, for the Durham delegation, um, Representative Renata Alston and Senator Natalie Murdoch, I had asked them on a previous podcast, and both of them were talking about the snack bar, and especially the seasoned fries. So, oh, um, yeah, fries yeah. are good. Durham is, um, I like the snack bar, too. So Durham doesn't eat well. <laughs> Unless we're in Durham, we have great restaurants. That's true. Yeah. Durham has a lot of good food. I'll give up, uh, my favorite place in Durham is to eat is Parker and Otis for oh, lunch. Yeah. What's your... What's your favorite place to eat in Durham? There are too many to name. Just okay. couldn't begin. That's a very political answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on to headliner of the week. Um, I'll go first. My, my headliner of the week is summertime. And by summertime, I mean legislative summertime, which it stops, it starts. It's a whole other dimension. Um, it is July, the fiscal year, we're two weeks in. Um, you were with other Democratic House members at a press conference this past week saying, where's the budget? Um, that's a perennial summer question, I think, no matter what the balance of power is. Um, I've gone to the beach earlier this <laughs> summer, um, plan to go again. Somebody told me you can't plan your life around the General Assembly. I have a little more freedom than you do because, you know, I don't have a vote <laughs> where with caucuses and being uh, somewhere. Um, so anyway, my uh, my headliner is summertime. And I believe your headliner is related to our, our where we are currently with uh, legislative summer. Uh, yeah, it's time to come together. And it's funny because the Democrats are in the super minority. To watch the stalemate and the delay into summer now is because the supermajority isn't coming together. And it's probably more of a fight between the Senate and the House mm -hmm. than it is Republicans and Democrats at this point. So let's come together. Let's go on vacation. Okay, we'll see if that happens. Um, I won't hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> I won't either. <laughs> maybe, maybe by the end of August. So we'll I have a 103-year-old mother who keeps saying, when will they let you out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm coming, Mom. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, uh, Representative Maury, Thank thanks for being on. I'm Don Vaughn for the News and Observer. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.